George Adibui is the president and founder of Rayma Chapel International Churches with headquarters in Ilorin Kwara State. He is also known for his prophetic and peculiar anointing, especially at Crusade Grounds. He has a dynamic insight into the Word of God. He is happily married to Olorun Tui Mudupeola, who is also the vice president of the ministry, and they are blessed with three children, Faith, Faithful, and Faithfulness. I give glory and honor to God for the opportunity he has given me to share his word with us today. And my prayer is that this word will meet you in a way and in a state in which you can be a doer of it and not just a mere hearer. The Lord bless you as you listen. Shall we open our Bibles to the first epistle general of Peter, chapter 1. And I will read just one verse of scripture, and that is verse 7. And the word of God says that the trial of your faith be much more precious than that of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. By the grace of God, I will be teaching you in this session on the subject building a faith for the impossible. How can I build a faith for the impossible so that the impossible as it were becomes possible with me? Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for your word. We rejoice at your word like one that found great spoil. Let your doctrine distill upon us like the views upon the herbs. Let your word and your spirit be glorified. And above everything else, help us to be doers and not hearers only, deceiving our own selves. We give you the glory and praise, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Building a faith for the impossible. One thing I accepted as a very young Christian is the fact that the Bible, the word of God, is a manual for living. And as I have read the Word of God and I've studied the Word of God, in my over 40 years of being a born-again Christian, I've come to discover that the Word of God tells us how to live. The Word of God tells us to live a life that is a true reflection of the price that was paid for us on the cross of Calvary. The Word of God tells us to live a life that is a full reflection of our potentials. In other words, what you are capable of doing, what you are capable of having, what you are capable of becoming, and how far we are capable of going. I've also come to realize that the Word of God encourages us to live a life that is pleasing to God, a life that is pleasing to God above everything else. I also come to realize that the Word of God uh, impresses us that you and I should live a life that is an inspiration and a challenge and a motivation to other people. Also, I've come to realize that the Word of God also teaches us how to be a blessing instead of being a burden. How can I be a blessing instead of being a burden? Not only should I be an inspiration and a challenge and a commercial advertisement of what God is capable of doing and who God is, but God wants us to live a life that he is a blessing and not a burden. And finally, I've also come to realize that God would give us instructions and guidance as to how to live in line with his word. The Lord is saying God's word as to how to live in line with his word. I believe that the kind of life God in his word wants us to live is a life that we call, uh, we call the ultimate lifestyle. I believe the Word of God has made provision for you and I to live a life that I refer to as the ultimate lifestyle. The Word of God says in Matthew chapter 4, verse 4, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. God's Word is God's provision for us to live the ultimate lifestyle. The Word of God tells us that we should seek God and live. So there are so many things God's Word tells us. 
But when it comes to living the kind of life that I believe God wants us to live, there is one particular thing that I want to point out in this session. To plan to live in any other way, apart from the way that this is a thing I want to emphasize, cause for us to live, is to live a life less than the ultimate lifestyle. And that is, the Word of God tells us to live a life of faith. It is repeated four times. It is repeated four times in scriptures. In Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 4, the B part says, the just shall live by faith. In Galatians chapter 3 verse 11, it also says, the just shall live by faith. In Romans 1.17, he said, hearing is the righteousness of God for free from habit. Uh, Romans 1.17, it says, the just shall live by faith. And in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 38, it is now the just shall live by faith. If any man draw back, he said, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. So much is the emphasis on the need for you and I to live by faith. Right? Romans 14 tells us in verse 23 that whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Faith is vitally important in our relationship and our fellowship with God. At the point where you and I got saved, okay, as a believer, when we gave our life to Christ, the Word of God tells us that we got saved through faith. Ephesians 2, 8 says, For by grace were you saved through faith. And in Romans chapter 12, verse 3, tells us that we were given the measure of faith. In other words, it is the measure of faith that was imparted into our heart when we come to hear about the gospel, which made us accept Jesus, that is called saving faith. However, that measure of faith that is put into our heart at the point where we got saved is not enough to live on, though it is enough to get saved on. So we all started out with saving faith. But for the kind of life that God wants us to live, there is something called general faith. And that general faith is a product of building on the saving faith with which we all started out with. The situation whereby our saving faith is not enough for us to live on creates the, the situation where we need to build upon our faith. So your faith is one aspect of your life that you need to build on. In fact, the apostles at the point in time in Luke 17, verse 5, how to tell Jesus, Lord, increase our faith. So if God wants us to live by faith, and the measure we get at the new birth is not going to be enough to live by, so how do you build your faith? Or how does God help us to build our faith? Because the faith by and through which we got saved was imparted to us by God. But that needs to be built up on. So, how does God help me to build my faith? Does God have some vitamins or is there a seminar I need to attend for my faith to be built? Or is there a therapy that I need to undertake for my faith to be built? Is there a place I need to go? Is there someone I need to see? Is there, are there some uh, 10 quick steps I need to follow for this to happen? Well, after being a Christian for so many years, I will let you know, understand this, that there are three ways I know through which our faith can be developed, through which our faith can grow, through which our faith can be built up, whereby it can be built up to do the impossible and see the impossible become possible, as it were, in our lives. And those three ways are as follows. Number one, you feed your faith by studying in the Word of God. You meditate in the Word, you read the Word, you speak the Word, you hear the Word, you study the Word, and in this way you build capacity for your faith to grow. You supply your faith with the raw material with which it can be built. Number two, it's not just enough to feed. The second thing you need to do to build your faith, to grow your faith, the second thing you need to do is to exercise by using your faith. 
You need to use your faith. You need to use your faith in your work. You need to use your faith to receive things. You need to use your faith in, in everything and in every area of your life. So it's not just enough to get fed. Even in the natural, it's not just enough for you to keep feeding and feeding without using the energy you derive from feeding. If you do not use the energy that you derive from feeding, then you're going to be flat. So number one is to feed on the word of God. Number two is for you to exercise your faith. And then number three is for you to have your faith tested. And in that way, your faith can be built up. Now, it is number three I'm going to talk about because that is what God helps us to do. The first one is what you are going to have to do. The second one is what you are going to have to do. But the third one is something that God will have to help you do. And that is why I want to speak on how you can build your faith or how God helps us to build our faith for the impossible. Now, let me say this to you. Faith is like a muscle. It can be stretched. It can be pulled. Just like muscles develop when used against weight. Our faith can also develop when they are tested. Whether you know it or not, every single day, our faith is being tested. Every single week, our faith is being tested. Every single month, our faith is being tested. And every single year, whether you know it or not, irrespective of what the year has offered, every single year, our faith are also being tested. Every year we are given opportunity, every single day and week and month, we are given opportunity to build our faith. The problem, however, is that most of us don't recognize it, and so we waste the opportunities God gives us for our faith to be built. But I want to show you the opportunities that God affords us with, whereby and through which you and I can build our faith to such a point and an extent that our faith can achieve and do the impossible. It is my intention to share with you ways in which God can God test our faith so it can be built up because God wants our faith built up. And we need to understand that. Now, when the devil tempts us, he tries to make us weak. But when God tests us or when he tries us, the consequence is that he intends that through the test or through the trial of our faith, our faith will be stronger, our faith will be more robust, our faith will be built up. The Word of God tells us that God tests his people. And it is through this testing that he builds our faith. The way we respond to the test of God is so important because the way we respond to the test of God is an opportunity for our faith to be built up. The Word of God tells us that the Lord tries us. In Psalm 17, I mean, Psalm 11, verse 5, it says the Lord tried the righteous. It means test the righteous. In Psalm 17, verse 3, the Word of God says, Thou hast tried me, thou hast tested me, thou hast visited me in the night, and thou shalt find nothing. And Job said, when he was going through that nine month ordeal that he went through, in the book of Job 23, verse 10, he said, When he has tried me, I shall come forth as go. So it's important for us to realize that. And that's what the scripture here says. The trying of your faith be much precious than of gold that perisheth. Though it be tried with fire might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. So when God allows us to be tested or allows us to be tried or when he passes us through some experiences, the intention especially if it is from God, is to make our faith stronger, to build up our faith, so that our faith will be stronger to take on impossible situations and assignments and be able to get the kind of results that you and I will desire to have in life. That is why First Peter chapter 4, verse 12 says, Think it not strange concerning those fiery trials that will try you, as though something strange has happened to you. In God's word, several people we are tested. And so you and I have to expect also to be tested because you and I are not different from them. They only happen to have come earlier than you and I coming. So when our faith are tested, it is intended by God, as it were, to grow. 
and that may be built. Abraham's faith was tested. We are going to speak a little about that today. Job's faith was tested. We are going to look into where and how it was. And even Joseph's faith was tested. He was sent to prison for 12 years for an offense he did not commit. So we are going to look at only five ways in which God helps to build up our faith. Five ways in which our faith are tested. And these five ways are ways you see in scriptures. And if you look at your life and you look at probably the life of people around you, you discover that is the same thing that has happened as well. So I'm going to give you one by one and explain them very simply. I know in my own experience of over 40 years of being a Christian, most of which has been a minister, I can point to various times and various places and return to various things that God did, as it were, to test my faith, which built my faith to the point where my faith is now to be able to take on impossible situations in whatever area of my life, they tend to show up. All of us need a robust faith. The faith to treat you God saved is called saving faith. That faith is not enough to live on. That's why I tell people accepting Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, Redeemer, and Lord is not enough for you to face life. You need to graduate from saving faith to general faith. And for you to graduate to general faith, your faith has to be built up. And in the building, number one, you need to feed on the Word of God. Number two, you need to exercise. And then number three, you need to be ready for your faith, as it were, to be tested. Now, the first way God tests our faith is through difficulties. Difficulties. It is through difficulties. Difficulties can be referred to as problems that come up in our lives. Trials, challenge, issues in whatever area. Difficulties generally, you know, Nothing happens by accident in our lives. As believers, everything is father filtered. When I say father filtered, there is nothing that happens to you that does not have to be given permission by God for it to be hap for it to happen. Because God already said in Zechariah 2 8, He said, I shall be a wall of fire and about you and the glory in the midst of thee. Zechariah 2 8 and 2 5. Then 2 8 says, Whosoever touched you, touched the apple of my eyes. In Psalm 105, verse 14 and 15, he suffered no man to do them evil. He reproved kings for their sake, saying, Touch not my anointed, do my prophet no harm. Psalm 34, verse 7. As the angel around about Jerusalem, so uh, uh, the angel of the Lord encamped around them that trusted him, Rana, and delivered them. And Psalm 125, verse 2 says, And the mountains are around about Jerusalem, so is the Lord done about his people even now and forevermore. Now, many of the problems and challenges and issues we go through in life, though, it doesn't mean that God plans it all, but they all come with his permission. At times, a problem is custom made to teach us faith. A problem comes into our lives to push us to a point where we have to believe God on a higher level than we have ever believe God. As Christians, we are not immune from challenges. Psalm 34 verse 19 says, many, actually the Hebrew says, divers and varied are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivered them from them all. And uh, by the time we are delivered, you will discover one thing, and that is our faith has been built up much more than the level of faith we were in before we went into it. That's why the psalmist said in Psalm 19, Verse 71, he says, it is good for me to have been afflicted. Romans 8, 18 says, for we reckon that the sufferings of these present times are not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed. Second Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17 says, our light afflictions, which are just but for the men, work it for us. So the one way in which God causes your faith to grow is by testing you through difficulties. Our light affliction, which are just but work it for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. There are certain lessons of faith that are learned only in affliction, more than ever. In Isaiah 48 verse 10, God says, I have tested you in the furnace of affliction. The way to respond to tests as a result of difficulty, whatever difficulty you face, it could be marital, it could be financial, it could be in your job, it could be in your health, is what James 1, 2 tells us. It says, 
He said, count, uh, count it. Look at it. He said, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations and trials. So when you are under heat as a child of God, the way to get your faith built is for you to relax, rejoice, take it easy, thank God, praise God, because he has a plan for it. Acts 16, 25 tells us at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God. The way to get your faith built is that when test and trial, temptation and all irritations of whatever type come, learn to sing, relax. Do not get agitated because God is in control. First Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. There is no temptation that is taking you as soon as it's common to man, and God is faithful. Who will not allow you to be tempted about what you are able to bear with every temptation, he will make you way of escape. So every difficulty, every challenge, every issue that comes to our life are such that they are God filtered. In other words, they never come without him knowing. And he will never allow you to be tempted about what you are able to bear. So you can always use the opportunity to grow your faith. Be fully, be fully aware that God who has called you is faithful, who also will do it. And that he will never leave you nor forsake you. So being thankful in problem is one way you will know as to whether your faith is growing. If you face the situation, and in the midst of it all, you can continually rejoice and be thankful, then your faith is growing. That situation has caused your faith to grow. For Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 16 says, rejoice evermore. God uses difficulty to test our faith. And when our faith are tested by such difficulties, our faith are built up, our faith grow, and our faith are now ready to take on higher challenges in the days ahead. You will notice as a child of God that some things that used to terrorize you years ago as a child of God, if you had the right attitude in them, today no longer mean much to you. I mean, I was thinking about some things that used to bother me as a young Christian, you know, in the early days. And I now look at the same thing and say, piece of cake, because my faith has since grown to be able to operate in levels that are higher than the levels I was years ago when I started on my Christian pilgrimage. Number two way, now, let's go on here. Number two way we God test our faith is through demands that he places on us. This is usually when he asks us to do things that we think are impossible. Whenever God asks you to do things that are impossible, you know what he's trying to do? He's trying to build your faith. Things that when he asks you to do are impossible. I remember when I received the call of God upon my life into the ministry. I mean, I just, I was so overwhelmed. I have called you, I have chosen you, I have ordained and anointed you to take my water to the nation. The first thing that terrorized me was, how is that going to happen? But the point is, he gave me the idea that he is not asking me to take on the nations now. But you see that he gave me such a thing was intended to build my faith. To build my faith. In those days, it looked impossible, but today I've surmounted it. I have gone to all the six habitable continents of the world, to over 126 countries. Now, let me say it like this. In the New Testament alone, there are over 1,050 commands for us to obey. Of those commands, some will look to you as unreasonable. Of those commands, some will look as inconvenient. And of those commands, some will look as impossible. However, all of them are there for our good. They are there to test our faith. Whatever command you see in the Bible that looks unreasonable, that looks inconvenient, that looks impossible, they are given by God to test your faith, to help your faith get built up. Now, this kind of situation is a test of faith because the issue is when I'm going to, well, the issue is whatever a command is given to you, you are going to have to decide who you are going to believe. Am I going to believe what God said I should do or am I going to do what I think is right to do? I remember some years ago as a young Christian, when I read Philippians 4, 6, he said, be anxious for nothing. I said to myself, no, 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 no. 
You see that, but that is what God says. So, why the test of faith is that you're going to have to make a choice. Am I going to do what God says to do, or am I going to do what I think I should do? I remember also as a young Christian, when I saw Matthew 5, 44, where it says, love your enemies. <laughs> I said, love my enemies? I said, that's going to be tough. I don't even love everyone around me. No, talk about love my enemies. I'm blessing those that cost me. I'm praying for those that this family use me and persecute me. So it's important for us to know that another way in which God helps our faith to grow is by putting a demand on us on something he wants us to do. And the way it helps us grow is, it helps us grow because by that demand that is put upon us, we are now going to decide whether we are going to obey what God says we should do or we are going to do what we think we should do. I remember also when I saw First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18, when it says, in everything, give thanks. Everything, that was, that was, a, that was, a, that was, a, that was a shock to me. God gives a command in the Bible, in everything, every time. So let's see it like this. Every time God gives a command in the Bible, it's a demand placed on your life. It's a test. Whenever you read a demand that God puts in the Bible, when he says, avenge not. Now, that is a demand he's placing on you. And you're going to have to decide whether you're going to do what God's word says, which will grow your faith, or you're going to do exactly what you think you should do. It's important for us to realize that. In Exodus 16, for example, God reigned manna, but told the children of Israel not to take more than is necessary for a day, because he wanted to teach them to rely on him daily for daily bread. But some people wasted the opportunity. God will put a demand on you. And whenever he puts a demand on you, it's an opportunity for your faith to grow. Jesus looked at those people in John 2. He said, go and fetch water. They went and fetched water. And after they fetched the water, he said, go and draw again. The people have, must have looked at each other. But you see, that demand that is placing upon them to do whatever he says, which the mother advised them earlier in John 2, 5, was an opportunity for them to grow. Evidently, that caused the faith of the people that drew the water and the faith of the people who knew about what happened in that situation as it were to grow. It's important for us to know that whenever God puts a demand on us, it's, an, it's a test, it's a test, and it's an opportunity to grow because it has an opportunity for us to decide whether we are going to do exactly what God wants to be done or we are going to do exactly what we think we should do. Faith requires instant or immediate obedience. When God says it, I should believe it. And I, when I understand it or not, whether I think it's reasonable or not, and so in that way, it causes your faith to grow. When God spoke to me and said, I have called you, I have chosen you, I have ordained and wanted to take my word to the nations. Now I had to decide whether what God was saying was true or whether what I think I should do was the right thing. In 1982, when I wanted to go to the United States, I wanted to relocate, and God said, no. So I had to decide. If that was a command from him. Stay where you are, like he spoke to Isaac in Genesis 26. Stay where you are, don't go anywhere. So it caused my faith to grow and believe more in what God said when I obeyed him. If you're going to have faith for the impossible, it has to grow. It grows by feeding it, it grows by exercising it, and it grows when God tests it. And one way we God tests us is by difficulties. The second way, which I just explained, is by not just difficulties, but by putting a demand on us to do something that looks unreasonable, that looks inconvenient, that looks impossible, but which if we extend what God's word says to be more and better, than what we should do, and we do it, it builds our faith. The psalmist said in Psalm 119, verse 128, I have esteemed all things concerning your word to be true, and that has taken me away from every false way. That was what Job did. Job believed what God said about him and to him, that what the circumstance or situation was leading him to accept as what he should follow. So it's important for us to do this. The way to evaluate yourself is to ask yourself this question. How quickly do you do what God tells you to do? Or does it 
take it being convenient for you to do it if you do it regardless then your faith is growing job said the job 13 15 he says though he slay me i put my trust in him okay now at that point that job was speaking his faith had grown his faith had grown through difficulty but much more than that his faith has also grown because there is a demand on him to either go god's way or go the other way and he did the right thing now quickly because of time here the third way in which god tests our faith is to delay one thing about human nature is that we don't like to wait most people hate to wait and let me say to you i used to be like that i hate to wait we don't like traffic jams we don't want to wait on queues anywhere you know so what god does is this he uses delay to test our faith you see many christians erroneously believe that every delay has to be resisted every delay has to be challenged every delay is satanic every delay has to be cancelled and i've seen people set up programs like that no more delay and what they are saying that including whatever the delays god orchestrates or the delay that is from god they will resist it but that is inappropriate it's important for us to know that god has been known to use delay he told abraham at a particular age that was going to be a father of many nations 24 years after nothing happened now that can be the devil that is god because god already told him romans 3 4 let god be true and let every other person be a liar so god already told abraham but you see that abraham became the father of faith not just because god told him what he told him and he believed him but 25 years after abraham still believed god that is why hebrews chapter 6 verse 12 says be not slothful but follow us of those who through faith and patience inherit the promise he said, when God made a promise to Abraham, verse 13, because he could swear by no other, he swore by himself, verse 14, saying, in blessing, I'll bless you, multiply, I'll multiply you. Verse 15 said, and Abraham inherited after he had patiently endured. So when God causes a delay, it's a test of faith. At times, some delays, especially the ones orchestrated by God, is for you, is for your faith to be supported by the force of patience. Isaiah 28, 16. He said, Behold, I've laid in Zion for the foundation. A stone, he tried stone, a precious corner stone. He said, He that believeth shall not make haste. Abraham did not stagger the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith. You see that? Strong faith comes how? Being fully persuaded that what God has promised is also going to faithfully bring to pass. So the third thing that God uses to help build our faith is delay when you're already convinced that something is what it is and there is a delay that you know is orchestrated by heaven or by god and you hold fast to what you have which is your profession it helps to build your faith for the impossible let me give you this in hebrews chapter 10 verse 35 he said cast on away therefore your confidence who was great in conscience of the world verse 16 says for you have need of patience after you have done the will of God that you may reign the promises. Yet a little while and he that will come will come and will not tarry. He said, But now the judge shall live by faith. But if any man come back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. So God uses delay. He uses delay to help your faith to be built. When Jesus Christ was ascending to heaven, he spoke to 5,000 people that they should go and wait in the upper room for the infilling of the Holy Spirit. 10 days later, of the 500 that he told to wait there, only 120 people were left. What is that? God used delay to build. The people who stayed, the 120 people, had their faith built by the delay to such a point that when the Holy Ghost came, there was not even one of them that was left out. Divine delay try our courage and patience divine delay it tries our courage and patience it's important for us to know so, i mean james 5 7 says be patient therefore brethren unto the coming of the lord 
For the husband man waited for the precious fruit of the earth and has long patience for it. We don't just need to have faith, we also need to be patient. Faith that is strong is also going to know and understand that patience. What well, in 1982, God said, I will, I will not go to the United States as I've decided and as I've planned and as I've intended. Well, I patiently waited for the salvation of God. Count it all joy when you fall into diversity, knowing that the trial of your faith worketh patience. Let patience have a perfect work. God does not only help us to, to build our faith by testing us with difficulties, allowing difficult things in our life. He does not just help to build our faith by putting a demand on us to do things that are impossible, to do things that are inconvenient, to do things that, that look unreasonable, but he also helps to build our faith through divine delay. Delay is not denial. The fact that it has not happened does not mean it's not going to happen. The fact that it has not taken place is not an indication that it will never take place. So be patient. Faith that is strong is also patient. Let me say this. Some people are just very impatient. They are saying, how long will I take this thing that is happening in my life? How long will I have to wait? When am I going to have a baby? Or when am I going to find the right job? If you have been waiting for God to do what he has promised you, the delay to it is just a test. If he has promised you. God promised me he was going to take me to the nations. This was in 1981. And I thought it was going to be 1982. I thought it was going to be. It's because that's human nature. Human nature is always being in a hurry. Human nature is always in a hurry. And the Bible tells us that Proverbs 19, to that impatience, we get us into trouble. And according to Psalm 16, verse 4, those who are because of the hurry, hasten up after other things, you will mess up a number of things in your life. So I thought it was going to be 82, 82 came nothing. 83 came, 84 came, 85 came, 86 came. It said, it, it will look like it's not going to happen. It's important for us to understand this. God will test you with delay. And eventually, when 89 came, it happened. This was eight years after. The delay helped my faith to grow. Because I held on to God. I was giving glory. I was giving praise. Like Abraham held on to God for 25 years before the promise came to pass. God had promised us to, to have some things, but he does not tell us the time. And so there can be a delay. A delay more than usual is an opportunity to get a better thing than whatever you have, will have gotten in a hurry. The Bible says in Isaiah 36, 18, the last verse, he said, blessed are they that wait on him. Isaiah 64, verse 4, he said, I have not seen, he have not had that as he entered into the hearts of men, the things that God have reserved for them who wait. When your faith is built up because of divine delay, and you still stand, have not done all to stand, the only thing you're going to get is the best of what God wants you to go to get to grow in faith. Know this that God will not snap every instant answer to your prayer because there are some people, Jehovah Sharp Sharp, today, 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 Jesus will answer me today, today. Now, there are certain things that God will say yes to, like that. You know, when it comes to how God answers prayer, there are some answers that are yes, there are some answers that are no. There are some answers that are yes, but not yet. And whenever that is the case, it's not to now make you throw in the towel and abandon the ship and close your eyes and imagine that everything is over. No, it's an opportunity to build your faith. It's an opportunity to keep studying the word, to keep praying, to focus on him, not to be deterred, not to be removed. God will not give easy, straight answers of yes to every prayer. He wants us to grow in faith. You need to ask yourself, how well are you doing waiting? I'm a good, you see, I'm a good waiter. I, I love to wait. Then I wait upon the Lord. 
Isaiah 40, 31 shall renew their strength. My soul wait, wait down upon the Lord. Haste is never blessed. Impatience will only complicate matters. Do not give up so easily. Do you grumble and complain while waiting? Or do you keep believing, expecting God to test your faith? God will test your faith and by delay. And the day we only build your faith, help your faith to be stronger. It will help your faith. You see, when people have been waiting on having a child for a number of years, you will see that it will it has refined them. The process has refined them. God many times is not in, interested in our comfort, but is interested in our character. So the third way in which God helps to build our faith through trying, trial, is by divine delay. A demand on God on you is a test of your faith. Divine delay is a test of your faith. Difficulties, challenges, and situations around us is a test of faith. Number four, the fourth way we God test our faith is by what we possess. When God puts his hand on what you possess, God uses what we have, like our children, our job, our money, to test our faith. This to many people is the greatest test. People don't know that God tests with what you have. He will test you with what you have. He told Abraham in Genesis 22 verse 1, bring your son, your only son Isaac, to a place that I will show you and there you are going to sacrifice him for me. Eventually when God did not allow Abraham to kill Isaac, God said to him, now I know that you fear me. And that was the basis upon which Abraham became the father of faith. He never became the father of faith just because God made a promise to him. No, he became the father of faith because he persisted and he persevered even when God laid hold on his son, his only son. God tests our faith by putting his hand on what we have. God tests your faith by making you lose that job. God knows you, your need will have to be met. And God has made a provision for your need to be met. Even if God will have to bring you bread and flesh in the morning and bread and flesh in the afternoon. But you see, when God touches the things that we have, it's a test of faith and it's expected and required to build our faith. There is a direct relationship, let me say this, between how we handle what we have and our spiritual depth. People to whom things and what they have are important and are very important are usually not spiritually deep. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of the things that he possesses. In Mark chapter 10, you remember the story of the rich young ruler? The Bible said this man saw Jesus. Read it from verse 14 to 21. He said he ran towards Jesus. He knelt down and he said, good master, what good thing can I do that I may embellish the everlasting life? And Jesus told him, do this. He said, I've done all of that. I've done all of that. And then God put, he, he put a hand on his possession. He said, go. But the, the, verse, the Bible tells us in verse 21, he said, Jesus looked at him and loved him and said to him, go sell all what you have. Give to the poor. Then come take the cross and follow me. The Bible says the man went away. How sorrowful is a test of faith. But you see, he had passed that test. Like Elisha passed his own test. It should have been a different thing entirely. In the final analysis, it isn't God that determines what you and I get from him, but it is us. What we do with what is ours, when God puts a demand on it, is what determines how much God can bless us. When we willingly give to God something that we can use otherwise, is a test of faith. And remember, several years ago before I come, come overseas, I would have to go to the bank for what they call basic traveling allowance. I can't remember last when I did that. And it all started in 1990. I went to the bank, 
and my daily traveling allowance on that occasion, 19. So I came with it to the UK and I went somewhere and I was preaching. I was the preacher. And after I preached, the pastor came to take the offering and he said, God spoke to him that today was going to be the end of financial lack to some people if they will obey him in terms of what he says. The devil said to me, don't listen to him. He said the same thing last Sunday in church. He said, whatever God tells you to do, now do it. The devil said, how will you do that? By that time, you see, normally in those days, I put my offering in the right pocket. It's always cash in those days. And so I put 20 pounds in my right pocket. The remaining 270 pounds, which was from the 290, I put in my left pocket because I couldn't put it in the house where I was staying because I was not sure probably someone else would go there and make away the money. So I put in the left pocket. So I put my hand in the right pocket to bring out the 20 pounds. And I can hear God, like you're hearing me now. He said, no. Ah, then I said, what? Then what? Then what? And then he said, the other pocket. Jesus Christ, the other pocket? I cannot imagine the other pocket. Now, I was very, I was on this occasion coming for six weeks. This was my first evening. I was preaching. Out of the 290, God is asking me for the 270. You see, let me say this to you. <laughs> it's important for us to realize this. When you are willing to give God something that you can otherwise use for other things, is a test of it. So what did I do? It was tough for me. It was rough. It was the highest offering I've ever given up to that time. Today I give millions out to people. It doesn't even bother me. I give tens of millions to ministries. It never really bothered me. But you see, that was the breakthrough. That was, you see, when we talk about breakthrough, it talks about being able to give God what you could have used for some other things. And that is what will open the windows of heaven and then his blessings will be poured out upon you in an uncommon proportion. When you give sacrificially because the Lord has need of it, you have passed the test. I gave that money, 270 pounds. We finished the program, we went out. As we went out, a woman came and she was saying, please, I want to speak to Pastor George. Now, I was not Pastor George. I am Reverend George. Because there was a post, Pastor George Hargreaves there, who today is actually the chairman of the Christian Party in the United Kingdom. So they took the woman to Pastor this Pastor George, and he, she looked at the woman and man and said, "No, no, no, no." He said, "It's not the man." So they said, "Well, there's only Reverend George." So they brought the woman to me, and later she saw me. In fact, later she saw me. It was like I should give her the remaining twenty pounds in my pocket. My friend had grown. Just like this, my friend had grown. And the next thing that I bought, that the woman said, well, sorry, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a member of this church. I live in one of those blocks of flats there. He said, I was praying this afternoon, and God said I should go to my bank and take out all my savings and bring all of it. And there's a pastor judge that is coming here. I should hand over my life savings to this person. I said to myself, wow. The woman looked at me and handed over the money to me in a brown envelope. Ladies and gentlemen, that brand envelope, this was 1990, contained very close to 20,000 pounds. People have had the testimony before. That to me was the beginning. On that occasion, while I was coming back from the UK, I came back from like, to Nigeria from the UK with 49,000 pounds plus. It was very close to 50,000 pounds that I came back to Nigeria with cash me that went to UK with 290 pounds. How does your faith grow? Your faith grows when God puts a hand on your possession. Giving does not only test our faith, but the sincerity of our love. As to how truthfully we love the Lord. We love to give generously out of faith. And when we do that, whenever you give to God generously, you are passing the test. You are passing the test. Does your giving show your trust in God or does it show the fear of insufficiency? Ladies and gentlemen, you can build faith. Feed your faith on the word. 
You can build faith. Use your faith. Exercise your faith to get something. You see, there are some things that I could easily have gotten, but I said, no, I'm going to believe God for it. I'm going to believe God for it. And immediately I started believing God for those things. I started seeing those things happen in my life. Instead of having to get them myself, I said, I'm going to believe God for it. So the second way is exercising your faith. Then the third way is when God helps you. You and I need help. And one of the areas where we need help is for God to help to build our faith. And the way he can only help you to build your faith is by testing it, by stretching it, by putting a demand on it in difficult situations, by putting a demand on you to do things that are beyond you. Whenever God gives me an assignment, it's always initially bigger than I, but my faith grows with it because as we go ahead in obedience, God begins to help us do things that we never imagined we could do before. And then God will also help your faith grow by delay. Delay is a test. Delay is a test. At times, I test even people around me with delay. They ask me for something, I delay it. See whether they will get angry and stomp away. And another way, which is the fourth one, is when God puts his hand on your possession. It's a test of faith. And then finally, the fifth way God tests our faith is by giving us opportunities for choices. He gives you an opportunity for choice. And then he will watch. But if you are the kind of person who is interested in building your faith, you will make choices based on faith and not on sight. Lot was given an opportunity by Abraham in Genesis 13. Go this way, I will go that way. Go this way, I will go the other way. Lot chose by sight. Lot chose by sight. Moses had a choice. In, Matthew, in, in the book of Hebrews 11, 25, he said he, Moses chose to suffer affliction with the people of God that enjoyed the pleasure of sin for a moment. If your choices are determined by short-term gain, what you are going to experience is long-term loss. But if your choices are determined by short-term pain, then your future will be one of long-term gain. One way with God helps you to build your faith is to choose for you and for you to accept his choice, which is a difficult thing for most people. Psalm 25, verse 12, He that fear the Lord, him shall God teach in what way to choose. God tests our faith by giving us opportunity for choices. Deuteronomy 30, verse 19, listen. He said, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you. I said before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Then he advised, choose life. God is the only one who set questions and give you, the student, the answer. He sets the question. He said, I said before you life and death, blessing and cursing. He then he says, choose life, giving you the answer. That you and your children may live. I like something that Moses did. Moses chose short-term pain over long-term over long-term gain. Solomon was asked to choose. He said, I wanted to choose. First Kings chapter 3, verse 5, Second Chronicles, verse 1, chapter 1, verse 7. He says, Ask me whatever I will give you. And when Solomon made his choice, first Kings 3:10, he said, The thing that Solomon asked for please God. And God did not just give him what he asked for, but he also gave him what he did not ask for, that God made him someone that before him there was no one like him, and after him there was no one like him. How can I build my faith? By passing the tests. The test of life. The test that will come your way. The test of delay. The test of God wanting that which you have in your hand. The test of keeping you out of the palace for a while. 
the test of being in prison and not saying anything for an offense you did not commit. In all of these things, faith is built. Faith is built. Isaiah 7, 15 says, choose what is good. It's important for us to get to this point as I bring you a close to this exhortation. And that is, the way to live is to live by faith. But faith that got you saved is not going to help you live out the life of God. He has come that we may have life and live a fulfilled and is a, a, a life that is abundant in quantity and superior in quality. But if that's going to happen, then you are going to have to, as it were, you are going to have to build your faith. And how do you do it? You feed your faith. How do you do it? You use your faith. How do you do it? You allow your faith to be tested. You allow situations that are awkward despite the fact that you know what you should do. Number five things I've said today. I want you to take these five things and look at your life and ask yourself, in all of these five situations, what are the things that I will ordinarily normally have done? I want to commit you to God's hand and that as you open your heart to God in prayer, the Lord will put in your heart his direction, his instruction, his correction, and the Lord will help you to do what is right in every situation. As God put a demand on what you have, as God put a demand on your life, as God put a demand on whatever you've made up your mind to do, the more we yield to God, the more our faith grows. You see, faith actually can be defined as coming to a point where yielding to God is superior to yielding to any other thing. And when you yield to God, you yield to his word. And in that way, no matter what is happening, you are using your sixth sense, which is a sense of faith. It's not what you see or feel or taste or touch. It is what you believe. May the Lord help you. As you go forth this year, may faith open unto you the way that leads to the place where you are destined for. May every negative door be shut ahead of you. And may the purpose of his will be done in your life. God bless you. In Jesus' name. Amen. <music>